Well, all right, Andrew, Arthur, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Yeah, so, you know, we, we've had you on here before. We actually had you on last year, May of 2023. And in that uh, episode, we talked about conflict management for uh, marriages healing after betrayal. And um, you do this incredible mediation work, which is kind of a, a unique lane in the space of, of ministry and counseling and just those types of things. So before we get into our topic today on listening, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, the kind of work that you do and a little bit more about Genesis um, Christian Mediation? Yeah. So uh, my firm, Genesis Christian Mediation, myself and my business partner, uh, Brian, uh, own the firm. We specialize really in two areas. That is in uh, church and, and nonprofit work, and then the family mediation work, that which just brings me here to this podcast. And in that family mediation work, um, what I spend most of my time doing is trying to help people save relationships that are in crisis, whether that be inside of family with parents and their adult children or siblings, or more commonly in marriage relationships, right? Uh, we try our best to come around and bring around a, a care team to support a relationship that's trying to repair uh, and resolve and eventually uh, reconcile. And how would you describe uh, mediation as maybe a, a nuanced or different from traditional counseling or even coaching or mentoring or some of those other kinds of strains of help? Yeah, abs- that's a great question. Well, I think where um, counseling uh, and mediation differ is in how pragmatic it is. So counseling, you're really going after some of the really deep, you know, how are you dealing with your anxiety, depression, family of origin is- issues, family, even family systems, um, uh, how your brain's working, things like that. Whereas in mediation, we're we're in the operation side of things. We're, we're focusing on, well, how are you making decisions together? How are you executing those decisions? How are you talking to each other? And how are you listening to each other? Those patterns, often we take in through osmosis in our lives, through family, friends, workplaces, whatever. And we get very little training on that and very little work on that because emotional health field without specialized counseling getting doesn't often address those things um, in the manner or in the depth that they need to be addressed in some cases. Yeah, that's really good. So let's dive into yeah. a very uh, uh, important area of not only what you do, but really what, what people who are uh, in recovery or dealing with a brokenness in their relationship or just even trying to enhance maybe a good relationship need to address, and that is the issue of listening. So mm-hmm. I want us to talk about listening. That might sound a little ironic, right? Talk about listening. But um, <laughs> but first of all, and this may seem like a total, like, okay, let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Can you just define what is listening? Well, how I would define it from a mediation perspective is listening is an act of love by which you try to arrive upon an agreed mutual understanding. Okay, let's unpack that a little bit because even just in that definition, I think there's more exploration that could go on there. Even the idea of bringing in it being an act of love. Can you unpack that a little bit more for us? How is listening an act of love? Well, if you look at listening from the biblical model, listening through love, uh, and Christ just talks about the attributes, right? Spiritual gifts and attributes and things. And he talks about love being the most important. Paul even says, if you have nothing else but love, then you have so much, right? Well, Love in and of itself is the creation of a pathway to, for a willingness to listen to someone else, right? And it's just, it's recognizing that other person at most, its most basic level has value and therefore 
when they talk with me, there is value and there is connection to be had. Yeah, it it almost makes me think uh, of of what I've heard before. I mean, I heard it probably first from my parents, especially my dad, um, but we've heard it in other contexts too. And that is, you know, the most valuable asset any person has is time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's, it makes what you're saying there makes me think of, well, if you're willing to give me your time to hear what I am saying, you are expressing love to me because you're giving up, you're sacrificing that most valuable asset. Mm -hmm. um, another thing you mentioned was the idea that you're aiming toward understanding. Can you, un can you unpack why that's so important to listening? Well, it's one thing to hear someone. It's a completely different thing to understand them. And even a more different thing to have a mutual understanding. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between just hearing and understanding? Well, hearing is, well, I can hear you. You you know, if you, let's say, Jonathan, that you're a passionate basketball fan, uh, but I don't like basketball, I can hear you talk about basketball and simply nod and, okay, that's great. I'm glad you're, glad you're excited about it, right? But that doesn't mean I'm understanding you. Like, I, understanding would require engagement, asking questions. Seeing like what, so Jonathan, what are you hoping to share with me about basketball today? You're really excited about your team. What's going on? Are you going to a game or something? Are you, are you, are, is there, are they in the playoffs? Right. And, and, and capturing why that excite, what that excitement means to the other person. And I know basketball is a, a very surface level analogy, but if you, it's, it's practice, it's the same um, constraints around anything. Uh, Dale Carnegie, you know, uh, if you're familiar with him, he wrote a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, and he writ that, wrote that in the late 1800s, and it's still considered a classic today. He talks about that, that there's n no greater gift than the sincere gift of attention. And that it's universally recognized because people like to talk about themselves. So when you give that gift of sincere attention, it's it's going to matter. Mm -hmm. And so then you go from not just hearing, but to trying to understand. But then you talk about mutual understanding. How is mutual understanding even different from just you having a maybe personal kind of understanding of what I'm saying? Well, that comes into uh, about this idea. It's more of a clinical idea about context and backstory. And just in this conversation, Jonathan, you and I, there are, there are three different contexts going on. There's your context of this conversation, mine, and then there's a shared context, what we both remember and agree upon remembering from this exchange. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you can have three kind of context for every given conversation between two people, then that, that tells me and tells us by science that there's something about the shared context that's important. Mm -hmm. And so then how do you know if you have reached that mutual understanding in listening? Well, that's a great question. And one that I think is a, is a lifelong search, right? When you, when you have the, with the people that are around you closest that you love, right? And we talk about the ideal conversational pathway and that starts with, with listening uh, and in the background of that self-awareness, right? Because we're not going to listen well if we're not aware of what we're bringing into that conversation. Well, as we're listening, we're looking to ask questions that bring continual clarification, right? And as we gain more and more clarity, there's going to be a moment where we can say, I understand, right? I validate what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And then that person then, and, and some of the helpful tools of validating and, and, and helping someone know that you understand is, is paraphrasing or reflecting back what you've heard them say. So that, yeah, yes, you get it. We've arrived. We have an understanding. There's a, a modern listening expert that I follow a lot. His name's Oscar Tromboli. He's out of Australia. And he talks about this shift of idea in conversation because it used to be if you've ever had training in corporate America or or uh, on communication, you've heard the phrase active listening. Mm -hmm. well, um, that active listening is awesome 
and it's a great place to start. But what listening folks are recognizing is active listening doesn't measure if there's understanding. It helps somebody who's talking figure out if someone's paying attention or hearing them, but it doesn't measure understanding. So Oscar says this, he says, it's the listener's job uh, not to simply understand the speaker. It's the listener's job to help the speaker understand themselves. And I'm paraphrasing that, but the idea is that we shift the, 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 the most, the center of the conversation away from the speaker to the listener. Uh, and I, you probably don't remember this, Jonathan, but in the, when we talked last time, we talked about our brains, the speed at which we can listen and the speed at which, was, which we think and we talk. Well, if a speaker's thinking at 900 words per minute and throwing out 125 uh, every minute, 12% of the information that's in a speaker's brain is actually getting out, right? And so the listener's job, what Oscar's saying, is to help the speaker continually unpack more of those thoughts so that everyone can find what understanding means, right? Because the only the speaker has so much more going on in their head, yet they get we get out um, so little of that. Mm-hmm. Now, you and I were just, uh, and we're recording this at the very end of February, mm-hmm. and you and I were just together at a conference over the weekend where we were really highlighting story and the power and impact of story and why we need to engage story. And as as you were saying that about how there's, you know, only 12% is making it out verbally from the speaker's mind in terms of the information in there. What does that look like maybe from the listener's perspective to, to draw them out? Is is story an important part of that? Is is trying to engage? Because I'm thinking, you know, one of the things I just thought too was like, it's probably not helpful, Andrew, for me to look at you and say, hey, you're only telling me of 12% of what's in your brain right now. You know, there's got to be other ways to draw a person out. So how does the listener then tap into maybe the story that the, the speaker's trying to tell or the, or the information that the speaker's really trying to get across. Right. And that's where that, that's that area we called clarif- clarification, right? And that's the ability to stay engaged in the story, if you will, and ask those questions to understand, right? It's not just about how's your day going, uh, but, oh, wow, you sound like you're really excited about something. Tell me more about that. Or, or it's, wow, that was really hard. How are you feeling in that moment? Um, you know, it's, it's those second and third level questions um, that, where we really uncover things. Mm-hmm. So let's, uh, I want to kind of pull this into even a more practical environment because you know we deal with people all the time that are they're struggling with some kind of unwanted sexual behaviors they've got brokenness in the relationships as a result of that they've got a lot of uh you know trauma and isolation in their past they you know there's all kinds of um personal and relational dysfunction um much of it that was rooted and grounded in many childhood experiences and patterns that were developed from those families of origin so my question is first a personal one for you. Mm-hmm. How has what you are sharing here about listening impacted your own life personally in terms of maybe stuff from your own past or where you've not felt heard or how has this in- enhanced current relationships, this whole aspect of really being a good listener? Yeah, well, um, I think the the most immediate impact right now, if we're talking about today, is how I approach conversation with my children. Mm. Uh, it's recognizing that their brains are still in formation. Learning about listening and learning about the art of clarifying has spurred me on to asking more questions. And even though that often annoys the snot out of them. <laughs> it's still, I, I, I cannot believe the, the, not the information, but the connection that comes out of those questions 
and how my reaction I find is so much different after I've asked those second, third, or even fourth level questions to understand where their reactions and their their emotions are coming from. Um, that's been the the I say think the greatest and most immediate impact. I think if we go historical, coming from a very difficult divorce, um, listening became a whole new thing for me because I started to started to ask questions like where did where did I fail in this? What did I miss? Hmm. What questions were I what what questions were I was I not asking? Um, that led to my uh, my failure in relationship, and that really started me on a journey to to figure out, man, I, I could do a lot better job of listening with intention and listening um, for connection. That's good. So this may seem also like kind of a, a silly or maybe overly simplistic question, but um, and I think we've touched on a few aspects of this, but why is listening and improving our listening skills so important just for us as persons, as people? Well, I, I, I'm going to even go a little bit even deeper here. Like as we're talking about story and at that conference um, in, a, in a session, uh, I led a breakout session on hard conversations. And um, it's every relationship is going to have a moment of a hard conversation. And I love, and I've, I hope I pronounce his name right, Eddie Caparucci. Is it Caparucci? Yeah, Caparucci, right? yeah. Yeah, he has this, this wonderful um, concept that I've read about uh, from him called the pain field. And <clears throat> that is so, like, that's in the mediation room. Every, every meeting I'm at, we're in a pain field. And a pain field is simply when someone has a trauma, pain, or an experience that they've had, and it's them going back to that place, trying to process it, trying to work through it. And often the person they invite on that, and, and usually not willingly, is the person closest to them, right? I'm angry because of this. And the person closest to them might be thinking, well, we've had this conversation. I've apologized. I've done, what more do you want me to say? Right? Oh, can't you forgive? I thought you forgave me. What? I mean, I mean, haven't we all had those moments? Mm -hmm. Well, why is listening so critical? Well, it was made for that very moment. What greater gift can we, as the person who's sitting with someone who is reliving their trauma or pain, what greater gift of love can we give than to listen? and journey with them through it instead of instead of giving into that coping mechanism we might have of trying to flee that pain field because it's uncomfortable for us listening in that moment so critical what a gift of love and an opportunity for even greater connection and healing just by listening and being willing to ask questions that might be uncomfortable mhm mm so let's let's talk a little bit then about how do we actually do that? Because I can I can even I was even thinking in my own head and I'm thinking I'm hearing a lot of guys, especially that as they're trying to go through repairing a relationship that they've ruined by some kind of sexual betrayal or whatever. And they've gotten to certain stages where, hey, there has been some restoration. There's been some recovery that's been happening. There's and yet there can be all these trigger points, right, where all these reminders or whatever else can cause a, an emotional trigger response in their, in their wife. Um, how then do we become better skilled and aware of those moments where it's like the gift that I need to give right now is listening, not defending, not, you know, any other kind of response. What are some maybe practices or how do we put, start putting this into some practical application? Yeah, absolutely. The first, the first step is realizing, um, as you said, you know, we're coming from, we have some triggers around this. And just in that moment, realizing, taking a deep breath, it's not about me. Mm. Right? It's that, that very simple thing about listening is the, you're removing yourself as a, off the stage. 
right? You don't need to be up on stage with that person in that moment because it's not really about that. It's about what they're going through in that moment. And and sometimes we we buy into that myth that that an I'm sorry or I love you is a snapshot in time. Mm-hmm. It's not. Those words, I'm sorry and I love you, like we're broken people. And that, that that's like on our foreheads, right? It's not a snapshot. It's a state of being. And so in that moment, if someone's in pain, it's simply okay to remind them of this. And not in a how dare you forget it, but in a, hey, hey, I know who you are. I love you. I'm sorry for through the impact. How can I how can I listen? What do you need from me right now? That's the second thing is asking the asking the question of support. What do you need right now? How do you want me to walk through with this with you? Right? Cuz sometimes they don't even know and that and that's that's the hard part when you're with someone and they they may not know, but then it's the well, let me know when when you have when you have some thoughts, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, because some of this is it, we're talking about some typically very emotionally charged moments. Yep. And so I can even I'm even hearing some of the answers that have come back, uh, not not just in my own experience, but just in dealing with a lot of couples where okay, you know, asking the question, "What do you need from me right now?" And there's this you know this explosive response of well, I need you to have never done this in ever, you know, and there's a sense in which there's a, there can be a stuckness in the past and I get it. Those are pain points, right? All of that is part of the emotional triggers that are happening. So how important is it for the listener in this case, right now we're kind of giving the example of the husband being the listener and the wife is sharing her, her pain. How, how can it, how important is it for the, the husband to, kind of be going through over and over some of these things you've been saying. I mean, I'm imagining you got to revisit many times. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is not about me. Mm -hmm. I've got to enter into a supportive state. I need to be a reflective listener. How important is it for you to just kind of have to keep going through in your mind, these things over and over again as a listener? I, I think it's crucial, right? And it's crucial to be reminded of it. Uh, to put it this way, how often um, does your child say, I love you, hoping to hear back from their parent, I love you too, son, mm-hmm. I love you too, sweetheart, right? It's that reaffirmation that we all, that's a that's a, need, a human need, right? And the pain field, that moment of crisis, we want, we want to be uh, affirmed, right? And we want to have that reaffirmation. And sometimes, though, sometimes you need outside help. You need that that third party to help you in that moment navigate through it. If you're if you keep getting stuck there, right? Don't inflame. Get support. Don't escalate. Get help. Yeah. So then, um, what are some of the most common roadblocks that you see for good listening? Yeah. Distraction, number one primary barrier. Um, we listen at 400 words per minute and someone talks at 150. We can listen three, almost three times as fast as the other person. So the first thing we're dealing with is distraction caused by ourselves, right? So that's the first thing. Just, just listening is like an onion. You got to keep peeling back the layers of your own distraction to get things out of the way so you can be more and more engaged. Yeah. Any other any other roadblocks that you especially see in maybe even your own mediation? Yes. Number two, assumptions. Right? Uh, we, we have so much backstory and so much water under bridges, even the most simplest things, that we bring a lot into these conversations of our own assessments, right? And so those assessments can lead to assumptions, which cause us, which put up roadblocks to us actually listening effectively. Yeah. And I think that's one that, uh, you know, it's interesting of the two that you've mentioned so far, that's the one that I think I see the most, especially in couples 
that have you know been married for a while and then boom this explosion of unknown secret sexual behaviors comes about is then even trying to work through that healing there's all kinds of assumptions that can be made on both sides about each other so much um that really do prevent any kind of true listening especially like you said listening for understanding right right it's so critical and that that ties into another concept in the scriptures about listening and that's listening through grace right there's a huge there's a self implication of that like awareness of grace in our own life that allows us then to apply it in greater measures to other people's lives and that's so hard to listen with an unoffendable heart yeah are there any other roadblocks that you've seen to becoming a good listener um yeah i think um the idea the word uh the word or maybe the phrase better than thou right we Mm -hmm. We have this inclination is in humanity to put the word supreme around things like I'm I'm in, I'm over right I'm better than right we want to rank things and that happens it's you know that causes isms <laughs> out there right. in the world and it causes disconnection it's the moment that we we're objectifying somebody because we think that we're in a we're better. Whether that's because maybe we we haven't struggled with certain things or we haven't uh, experienced certain things that that we that we don't look at it the same, we don't have the same level of empathy or or understanding around it. It's that it's that I'm better than box, and that's what's so profound even about the gospel and especially the incarnation. Right? Was that the, truly the only supreme one who could actually bear that title chose instead to humble himself and become like us in order that he could connect with us. And if you, if you, you know, kind of put in these listening terms so that not only could, could we sense that he's really hearing us in our pain, but so we could really hear him, right? We could really listen to him. That's another question I wanted to ask is, um, you know, we've been talking about this listening as it applies primarily just between us as human beings, right? In various types of relationships. Can we talk a little bit, can you talk a little bit about listening as it pertains us hearing from God? What does that look like to be a good listener in terms of hearing the Lord? Yeah, I I always come back to being quiet. Sometimes the greatest barrier to listening is just to quiet our own voice, whether that's in our head as we're listening to someone else or, or our mouth is moving. And it's the same way with God. We take up so much space with our own thoughts and our own words that we don't have room for his often. And I know that's true in my life, right? When, I, when I'm feeling disconnected spiritually, I have to ask myself, well, am I, act, am I even listening? Mm-hmm. So as we are kind of landing the plane here, what are just some other thoughts that you would have that would help our um, our audience to be able to take the next step towards becoming a better listener? Yeah. Well, I, w- I would say spend more time in conversation, right? And on a single topic. So if you're if you're stuck, and we'll just throw this out there on dishes. Spend more than a minute talking about it, right? Because as we talked about, 12%, that's all the information you have in a minute, right? In, why not engage three or four and see what happens to your understanding of each other on that topic by spending more time talking about it? Uh, the second thing is, um, um, I think, um, choosing a good location to have hard conversations, right? Often speed gets in the way, right? We're reactive, we're, we're lots of life is going on. And so it's our inclination to move fast. And we have to resist that because speed is, isn't critical. There's so many things in converse, so many things in life that aren't time bound or aren't urgent, but we treat them as if they are. So mm-hmm. slowing down is so critical. Slowing down and giving space 
for listening and for relationship. Um, those are so, so super critical. We spend a lot of time in the mediation. When I'm doing relationship skill building with couples, we spend a lot of time talking about why are we going so fast? Yeah, that's really good. Um, this has been a great conversation. Now, I can imagine that a lot of our, our listeners and viewers, the only thing they're thinking of right now is like, okay, is dishes the issue in your home right now? I mean, is that the, is that the, the primary uh, point of conflict that you're having in your relationships at home, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, but it would, it's a safe one. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, that's good. Well, um, where, can, where can our listeners and viewers go to learn more about what you do? Um, easy. Go to our website. Uh, genesischristianmediation.com and contact us. Um, uh, we're happy to sit down and have a conversation with anyone uh, just to hear how we might be able to support or encourage you or, or get resources to you. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Andrew. It's always a joy to talk to you. And I love the way you bring a lot of clarity to issues that sometimes can feel uh, overwhelming, uh, especially something like this that on on its face, it appears as if it can be so simple. And yet, if most of us would be truly honest with ourselves, we're not that good at it. So oh. thank you for being here to have the conversation with us. Happy to, Jonathan. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Well, listeners, we are going to be putting all that information in the show notes. Uh, so check that out. And um, we are always so glad that you've been with us. We're here to help you take your next best step towards wholeness in Christ. So please reach out to us. And we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. Take care.